Good morning. Welcome to North Street. We just pray you be blessed with our service today. Uh, in all this uh, uncertainty of this world anymore, it's with all this coronavirus now hitting the area and, and uh, all the protests that are going on and everything else in this world that can bring you down right now. I found out that I've lost my job. That's after 30 some years, but you know what? I'm gonna use that as a positive. I mean, I'm not sad. I am really looking forward to what the Lord has in store for me in these next, how many more years I got on this earth, you know? And I just pray that I'll, I'll be able to bless somebody or do something that somebody's done for me in the past, you know? And I look forward to it, I really do. I mean, the, the world would want us to be down in our lives like this, you know? But God has a plan for me and for you. I mean, we're singing, our last song today is the Good, Good Father, you know? We all love our earthly fathers, and you know, but only God can touch our spiritual world where we need to be in our lives and carry it out into this, and be a light into this world, you know? And I just pray that each of you will be blessed today and, and we can lift us, each other up and, and just be blessed. Uh, we invite you to stand now and join us as we sing to the Lord. This day we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory's on our face. We're looking to the sky, descending like a cloud. You're standing with us now, Lord. Savior, he came. 
Take me as you find me All my fears and failures Fill my life again I give my life to follow You'll bless each one, Lord, in their travels, wherever they may go from here. And we just thank you for coming from the grave, Lord, and giving us life. And we just ask your blessings on the remainder of your service. And Ben, as he delivers a message, Lord, that you just open, we open our hearts to his message, Lord, to guide us and carry us through this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to pray as we, as we go into this message. Lord, I thank you for your love for each one of us. I thank you for bringing us together this morning. I thank you for the beauty of this world, that, this creation that you've created as we look out uh, at the leaves changing their colors and just how amazing it is. Um, just thank you for uh, how you lead us into different seasons of life, and uh, I just ask that you would teach us in this moment, in this time that we have together, teach us from your word more about you, more of who you are, that we can know you personally, intimately, Uh, and then also teach us about what to do in our daily lives as we, um, yeah, as we look to you. I ask that you would be, uh, that, yeah, you would teach us in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I titled the um, message this morning, Seeking Answers. And uh, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 28. And honestly, for me, uh, as I come into this weekend, it's kind of been overshadowed by local events. (laughs) <laughs> or things changing in our world, the, you know, everything, um, COVID-19 in particular, coronavirus. And I don't know about you, but I get tired of talking about COVID-19 and thinking about coronavirus. It's just everywhere, right? And yet it is a reality that we are all affected with, and particularly right now in the Canton area with the schools uh, going virtual because of it. And it's frustrating because just ignoring it, you know, ignoring COVID-19 doesn't make it disappear. <laughs> it's like still faced with it. And so what do I do in light of COVID-19? You know, from a leadership perspective, uh, it has been somewhat challenging. I'll just say that as a pastor here, trying to decide what is best, uh, you know, how to run a church service. 
And early on, we didn't know what this was going to look like. And we had uh, cancels our, our, or we had, didn't hold services here at, at this building on Sunday mornings in an effort to, you know, work with our government and trying to re- help to reduce the chance of spreading COVID-19. We really didn't know that much about it to begin with. We had no idea if it was ever going to come to our local area or, um, yeah, when it was going to come. And the, and the question for all of us that we had to answer was, what do we do? What do we do? Do we continue working? Do we continue to meet for church service? Do we just isolate ourselves? How do we do school? Because school was like no more school. You know, you couldn't go to the school building anymore uh, at the end of last school year. How do we, how do we teach our children uh, at home? You know, when you're not used to it. I know the homeschoolers were all like, oh, yeah, this is, we, you know, we don't homeschool. And that was a challenge. Do we do what the state government wants us to do or what Governor Wolf is asking us to do? Do we take the advice from scientists at the federal level, federal government of what to do? Do we... Do, uh, do we take what we feel like the President Trump, or President Trump um, is saying about COVID? And again, from a leadership perspective, it has been interesting because on one hand, you want the government just to tell you what to do, you know, as a church, uh, just to make it easy and how to handle the situation. And yet I can't deny that I'm also very thankful that, um, that our governor and our president have not forced churches in any way to have certain restrictions in place, at least not in our state. So we can be very thankful for that, and I am. But I look for answers. Answers, should I wear a mask or not? You know, that's a, that's a big one. And I have to admit, uh, I have been in some situations where I didn't wear a mask, and later I wish I would have. And I've also worn a mask when I, you know, felt like I should, but I probably actually didn't need to. And then I have to ask the question, you know, I'm a family man, I'm a father. How are my children understanding my attitude toward people I disagree with, you know, like the politicians I disagree with? Or just other people? Or how do, how do they view me as I, um, you know, as far as respecting authority because I'm, I'm an authority over them and how, do, how does that work? Do they see me just, you know, going against authority? It's, it's hard. And then there's these extreme judgments that are being made in our world today. It's like so extreme, uh, you're, you know, whatever... I'm for, you're against. Whatever you're for, I'm against. And it's always the most extreme positions that get propped up first. And uh, I'm just going to throw out this term. You don't have to agree with me on this because I know it's not entirely true. Uh, But I I feel like these extreme judgments come out uh, partly, at least, partly from what I like to say is the cesspool of human depravity, social media. Now, I know there's good things that you can use social media for, but I like to call it that. Um, It's just my, I guess it's my uh, interpretation of that. But we see it more and more where these extreme statements that are made on Facebook are no longer just virtual. They're no longer just virtual, but they actually become real and a reality. And they make great inroads into our culture. It has become difficult to even have a cordial conversation when there is such a heightened sense of urgency and everyone is just ready to be offended by anything you might say. Kind of reminds me of what Jesus was talking about when he says, out of the uh, heart, the mouth speaks. And we're seeing this, the, the evil that comes out of the heart. And it, 
You know, it might go up on social media, and then eventually it becomes reality. It becomes acted on in our world. And so, where do we go? So my, my question, I guess, along with that, that's kind of a tangent thing, but where do we go for answers when you're seeking answers of what to do? Do you go to Facebook? Do you just ask what your friends are doing? Um, maybe what the president or the governor says? Or what scientists are saying? Or, this is what I like to do, what Google is saying. And I have to admit that Google is for me, you know, when I, I go to Google for advice. It's high on the list for me. The problem is that no matter what, what I'm researching, or who I go for, to ask um, advice for, <clears throat> I actually find that I'm not actually looking for advice usually. I'm just looking for confirmation of what I already believe. I mean, think about it. When you go on Google, you can find whatever you want to back up what you already believe. That's called, uh, in a psychological term, that's called confirmation bias, by the way, it's for those of you who like that sort of thing. And I was thinking back on my life about times where I was at least giving the appearance that I was seeking advice. And I was thinking about my dad when he was alive, and I was thinking about different conversations I had with my dad um, about lots of different issues. And uh, I was thinking how usually when I was prodding him, uh, it, it wasn't so much that I was looking to him for advice, but I was looking for approval for what I was thinking was true, for my case, so to speak. So the question, again, this morning are these, what are you seeking and what is your source for seeking an answer of what to do? Because in 1 Samuel chapter 28, we see Saul once again in a dire situation. And he just has to know what to do. He needs to find out what to do in his dire situation. We see in this chapter where we are reminded once again that Samuel, the prophet, had died. He had already died. And this was Saul's man. Who t he would go after him to seek advice, to tell him what to do. And, uh, but he had died. And now Israel was being invaded by the Philistines, their arch enemies, Right? They, the Philistines wanted to destroy Israel to take over their land. But they're being invaded by the Philistines and they're setting up for war. And so Saul goes out and he gathers his army and he gathers for war. And he sees the Philistine army and he is shaken with fear. He is like, this is not a good situation. I don't know what to do. He's very afraid. And so what does he do? He does the usual thing. He's going to go seek from the Lord of what to do, right? But God is not answering him. Not, not the usual ways. Usually God would reveal his will to him through maybe a dream. That was a common thing that happened in that time. Or there was this thing that they called the Urim and Thummim. And I don't know that much about them, but we don't know a lot about them, but it's probably something like a casting of lots of some sort. But God was not revealing his will through that either. And then we see that the prophets that, that he was going to, they, they weren't getting a word. There was nothing. It was like calling and calling on the Lord, but there was nothing. It's like you call in on the phone. You don't get an answer. So what do you do? You text. You don't get an answer. You email. You don't get an answer. They just dropped off the face of the planet. God's not giving an answer. So what does Saul decide to do? He decides to seek out 
a medium or a necromancer. Now, mediums, um, he, what's interesting about this <coughs> is that mediums were actually outlawed in Israel. You see, Saul, as one of the laws that he, he had put in place was to drive all the mediums out. Now, a medium is somebody who mediates between the dead, so someone who's in the place of the dead, and those who are living. And uh, so they talk to the dead. And this is a very common practice in ancient times, in ancient lands. I mean, it wasn't something you outlawed, okay? But for Israel, it was, an out, it was not. You were not supposed to do it. God had forbidden it. And it's even common practice today, I would say. Uh, you know, it's very common for people to seek out mediums, even today, to talk to the dead. So Saul actually goes to seek out a medium who he outlawed to try to get an answer of what to do. He, <coughs> oof, it's not coronavirus, don't worry. <laughs> Saul was seeking an answer in the wrong place. Just like me when I go to Google, maybe, maybe. He's looking for an answer, and he is so desperate to find an answer that he'll take one wherever he can get one. This happens a lot to us today. We, we have mysteries out there, right? These big things that we want explained. Why is COVID happening? And what's up with all the weird numbers? And what's up with all these things that I hear going on where, you know, testings are happening and they're not accurate or, they, or are they or maybe they're not. And we need answers. And so we come up with all kinds of theories as to why things, and, and, and you know, we know, then we know, or at least we think we know. Why? So Saul is just anxious. He's trying to find an answer, and so he finds a medium. He does find one. Uh, he sends out some men, and they go, and they say, yep, there's, there's someone here. And she's, it's a, it's a woman, and she is scared for her life because she's like, hey, Saul outlawed me, you know, and uh, I don't want to die. And they're like, oh, no, you won't die, you won't die. And Saul doesn't even tell her that he's Saul. And then uh, she asks him, Okay, who do you want me to bring up? Who do you want to talk to? And get this. He says, I want to talk to Samuel, the prophet Samuel. He doesn't want to talk to God. Of course, God isn't in the place of the dead, I guess, maybe. He wants to talk to Samuel. And as Samuel, apparently it happens. There's some debate to this as if it actually happened or not. I just kind of take it for what it says, okay? But Samuel appears to the medium, at least. And uh, it re it's revealed that this is Saul, that Saul is the one, and the, and the medium sees Saul and is like, what? I thought, you know, you outlawed us. And he's like, don't worry, I'm not going to kill you. It's not a trick. So then, Saul and Samuel proceed to have a conversation. So here I have some, uh, a picture, uh, an artist rendition, you could say, of what's happening. Because uh, it's, it would be a very shocking thing, right? You have this dead person appearing, and it's happening. Okay? So we see uh, in in verses, we're gonna, this is where we're going to focus, verse 15 through 19, okay? And it's this conversation between Samuel, who's in the place of the dead, coming up, and Saul. And uh, Samuel speaks first in verse 15. It says, Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answers, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me 
what I shall do. There we have it. It's the open book of Saul's heart. He doesn't know what to do. And that's why he's seeking an answer from, through a medium from Samuel. And Samuel said, why then do you ask me? Since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy. The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Sorry, I miss, um, there's a misprint. You instead of your, it's supposed to be your. Uh, anyhow, that's a whole nother side point. Okay, what's the point here? Uh, Samuel's asking him the question, why are you seeking me? Go make it right with the Lord. This isn't between me and you. This is between you and the Lord. Why are you seeking me? He's turned from you. And he's become your enemy. And he's like, I told you what was going to happen. And now, in God's eyes, the kingdom is no longer yours. You're no longer the king. But David is. In God's eyes, David already has the kingdom. Verse 18, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek and the Amalekites, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Here we see the reason why Saul, in the first place, had the kingdom torn from him. And it's almost like Samuel saying, if you would have just repented and done this Done, done the right thing. You know, I, I really believe that God is the God of second chances. And even in the Old Testament, if Saul would have, have repented during this time, had truly sought out the Lord, that I, I think the Lord may have given him another chance. I don't know. But Saul, it's never alluded to that Saul was, you know, Uh, sorrowful over these decisions that he had made early in his kingly career, you could say. He was stuck in his own ways and he didn't carry out the fierce wrath against Amalek. Verse 19, moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines and tomorrow you and your son shall be with me in the place of the dead. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. And he's just telling him what is going to happen. This is, um, he's just telling him outright, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to backtrack just a little bit, okay? Verse 18. What's interesting about this verse is that Samuel reminds Saul that he didn't carry out what he was supposed to on Amalek. He didn't obey the voice of the Lord. Think about that. Here Saul just has to know what to do. Guess what? Back then, when he was facing the Amalekites, he knew what to do, but he didn't do it. How often is that the case where we're going along in life and we're crying out to God and we're saying, just tell me what to do. And we read the scripture where it says, love your enemy, feed those, you know. And it's like, we just can't do it. Or we just won't. It's like, Tell me what to do in this specific situation, Lord. I need to know exactly what to do. And he's saying, well, just love first. Do, do what I've already told you to do. Don't worry about the specific situation. Do what I've told you to do first, and then we'll get there, maybe. Yeah, okay. 
So we see that this is the conversation that Saul and Samuel have. And then Saul, after hearing what's going to happen to him, that he's going to be with Samuel uh, in the place of the dead and his sons, and that Israel is just going to be uh, overtaken by the Philistines, he pretty much collapses and is like, which I think is understandable to some extent. So he's grieving over what is going to happen and what is happening. And eventually he, um, he regains his strength. They pretty much force him to eat because um, he wasn't eating. And, uh, and then they leave. And that's the end of the chapter. But as I was seeking what is it that God is telling us through this chapter, it just seemed that Saul needed an answer. Just like us, so oftentimes. And we see that the way Saul did it probably isn't the way we should do it. I'll just say that. He not only disobeyed God in the past when he knew what to do, but now that he didn't know what to do and God wasn't answering him, he was actually going against God in the way in which he was seeking for answers. You know, we talk a lot about how Jesus is the answer, and he is. Jesus is the answer. I'm so thankful for what we have in the scriptures, these stories, and that, you know, in the, in the whole big scheme of things, we can look at it and say, wow, look, how, look at what was happening in that time. And then we can look and we say, oh, but, but we as humanity... We're always seeking these answers, and, and, and guess what? God has given us an answer, and his name is Jesus. And it's not like, it's like we can go right to God when we're seeking him, when we're seeking an answer. And what's cool is it kind of goes both ways in some ways. It's like, it's like, we're seeking God for an answer, and we're frantically running around because we just can't sit still. We have to do stuff, I guess. Um, and, and we're frantically looking at what to do, and, and Jesus, God through Jesus, enters our world and says, guess what? You may be seeking the answer, but the answer found you. How often in this world do, 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 do I feel like, Lord, I'm just looking for an answer. I'm just looking for, to, for, to, to know what to do. And then all of a sudden, I realize I already had it in Jesus. Or he's come and he's found us. And, and I think about that, in, again, in the big picture. It's like God is sending Jesus into the world to be the answer for us. And he found us. And not only that, but he... He died for us, so then he's the answer to our, our, um, our sickness of sin. He's the answer to uh, all of those things. He, he died for us, so we, now we have forgiveness of sin. He, um, and not only that, but then he rose from the grave three days later. So now he's the answer for eternal life so that we can have life and we can, love, we can live uh, joyfully. Uh, Russ, you know... Like the bad news of losing a job, but you see the result in Russ, like how, he, how he's viewing it. How do you have that kind of hope? How do you have that kind of hope? Uh, you know, it's what God does. He gives us life. And so Jesus is the answer to those, those problems. And, and, and he did for me what I could never do. Or what Saul could never accomplish in fighting against the Amalekites. He did for me everything I should have done. My question is, are we looking just to know what to do? Or are we looking for God? And is God enough? Are we just looking to get out of our predicament and our situation? 
looking for the easy out, the magic pill? Or are we really looking for God? I have one story I want to share here at the... I'm kind of getting to the end. I won't keep you too long. I I have a story, though. uh, And I I might have said it up here once before. I don't remember. I'm going to say it anyways. When I was in Colorado, uh, my wife and I were living in Colorado. You know, this was a while back now. And uh, I was at a, at a, at one time in Colorado, I was at this kind of crossroads for myself. I was kind of, I really wanted a job, like a career kind of, because uh, I was, pro- I think I was working at the bike shop, although I'm not 100% about that at this point. You know, I wanted a real job. Well, I, yeah, I realized there's every job, yeah. Anyways, that's a whole nother story, but I thought I wanted a real job, <laughs> a real career. career. And, uh, and, and so I was really seeking, like, what, what, am I, what do I want to do in life? Like, other than sell bicycles, you know, because that was kind of my thing. And ride biking, bike and stuff, yeah. And I was really seeking God. I was just like, what, what do you want? And, and I remember I came home early from work one day, and Corlissa wasn't home. And uh, so I was like, you know what? It's perfect. I'm going to have some time where I just seek God, where I just, I'm going to get down on my knees. And so I got down on my knees, and I got my, my Bible out, and I'm starting to, you know, just pray and call out to God, what do you want me to do? What, what am I made for? As far as like a career and a job, like this specific thing. I open up the Psalms, you know, you're praying the Psalms and you're like, yeah, doing all this like really cool stuff and I'm just looking for an answer. Lord God, I just, could you just supernaturally place in my mind the thing I'm supposed to do? And then, you know what happened? I got the answer. It came flashing into my mind. I'm not going to say it was audible because it wasn't. I don't think. At least I don't remember it that way. This little thought was placed in my mind by God himself. And it was this. Go unload the dishwasher. (laughs) What? Okay. I, I can do. I can do that. I didn't even know if the dishwasher was loaded. You know, I didn't know if it was clean. Uh, and Corlissa wasn't home. She wasn't going to know anything about it. I don't even know if she did notice once I went and did it. But that's not the point. The point is I was seeking an answer to a job, a career, you know, one where I could actually afford to have a house and a family. We know how difficult that is these days. It's really difficult. That's a whole other side note. If you're in your 20s and 30s and you're looking to raise a family and afford a house, I feel you, man. It's hard. It's really hard. I'm super blessed, but I know there's a lot out there struggling. It doesn't matter how many hours you work. It's tough. Pursue your dreams, you know, do all these things, Lord God. All right, Ben, you're going to obey me in the little things? You're going to treat your wife right? Do it. Reminds me of a passage, I think it's 1 Peter 3 maybe, where Peter's talking about, you know, Treat your wife right. Because if you don't, your, your prayers will be hindered. God might hear your prayers, but pff, they're hindered. Saul didn't obey God in what he was told to do. Why would God want to listen to him? Later. 
Are we seeking God? Which, by the way, I sometimes, uh, my, my career found me, I guess I can say. You know, things did kind of move on from there. Um, that was a pivotal time. I had no idea I was coming back here. No idea at that time. But God was working on me to start pursuing pastoralship during that time, like seriously. But I had to unload that dishwasher. What are you seeking? What is your source for seeking an answer of what to do? You might not want to seek God. I'm just telling you like it is. You might not want to seek God. You might not like what God's answer is. His answer might go against your political party, might go against your community, even your friends. It might go against your rights as a citizen. Do you really want to do what God wants you to do? Along, that sounds heavy. And it can be hard, but, it's, but it doesn't have to be. I'd like to remind you that Jesus did say that um, he, he did promise that his burdens are light and his yoke is easy. And I think that when we show others the love of Christ through us and how we interact with others, that God ends up upholding us by his love. And as we seek to understand God and his love for us, we seek God as the answer, he will then show us how to love others. He will show us what those answers in particular are as we live day to day. So take that with you. Would you stand with me and will a worship team come up? I, um, if you've never, like, I'm saying all this thing and, and all these things, and maybe you're seeking God right now. Maybe you're like, you know, um, I've never really actually believed in Jesus or what he's done for me. Like, I've never really taken a hold of his love for me. Um, I'm just going to repeat this verse because I say it every time. Not every time, but a lot. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you want eternal life, believe in Jesus and what he came to do for you. He died for you. He rose from the grave for you. He's, he's, he's alive today. He's not dead. I mean, Saul wanted to talk to a dead guy. We don't have to talk to a dead guy. All right? We get to talk to Jesus. He's alive. And I'm so thankful for that. You know, I, sorry, this is another rabbit trail. <laughs> I often wonder what my dad would think. What would he think of what I'm doing right now? You know, like, would he approve or whatever? And sometimes I like to, you know, I don't know, you feel weird things, you think weird things, whatever. But guess what? I don't have to worry about that. Because if I'm following after Jesus, if I'm seeking Jesus, that's what my dad would want. I know that. I don't have to worry about all the particulars. I just have to worry about, am I walking in what Jesus has already told me to do? And am I continuing to seek him? Are you seeking him? Are you seeking a relationship with him? And if you haven't done that, please, I beg you. I, I'm telling you, you do it. Be in relationship. Be in that humility uh, state and just pray and cry out to him. Just, just say it. Just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, is ruler, is king over your life. That Jesus is Lord. Believe it in your heart, with all your heart. That Jesus is alive, he's resurrected from the grave, he is not dead. I mean, I think that, that takes a lot when you, you pray. You're acknowledging that he is alive. 
And so I ask that you would do that in this time. fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren." Searching for answers. 
So I don't know if you remember in, um, in the scriptures, uh, in, in John, in, in the book of John, the gospel of John, uh, he talks about how there's, there's John the Baptist, and he's testifying to who this man is, Jesus. He's saying, hey, this is the guy. This is the guy. This is the answer, right? This is your man. Uh, he, he's the one. And uh, so a couple of John's disciples are like, oh, okay, well, we'll go, like, follow him a little bit. And it says this in chapter, 30, or chapter 1, verse 37, it says, the two disciples, they had heard John say this, say that he was the Lamb of God, that this guy was Jesus. Um, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following. And I just imagine that he's walking on his way. And maybe he hears some footsteps behind him or something. And he's like, huh? And this is what he says. What are you seeking? What are you seeking? Lord, I thank you for being the answer for finding us. Lord, I ask that as we accept you and who you are into our lives, that we would be able to walk daily seeking after you and that we would do what it is you asked us to do. Lord, I ask that as we go from here, that we would tell others of the answer that we have found, the peace that comes, the extinguishing of fear, and also the love that comes out. Lord, I just ask that you would, through your Holy Spirit, just infuse that into us as we walk in our communities, as we minister to those, our neighbors, and maybe even to those who are sick, to those who are in need. Lord, 
We want your kingdom to come. Help us to be ambassadors of that. I ask that you would empower each one of us to do that as we walk out of here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. And if you would like to talk about salvation, please talk about it. <laughs>